Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice to see y'all here. Welcome back to our Beit Midrash. Uh, welcome back to Learning Together. I uh, hope everybody had a good week. Everybody feeling good. Um, sounded good based on the schmoozing before I turned on hit record. So uh, those who are traveling, welcome back. Glad to have y'all back. Uh, I know we have one or two who told me they were traveling this week, so we'll have to welcome them back next week. But that's fine. Um, we're glad you're here. Glad to learn together today. Um, welcome back. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, the Noam Elimelech, uh, Reb Elimelech of Luzinsk. Uh, we looked at him a few weeks ago, um, and we're going to come back to him today. Um, as a little bit of a refresher, um, Reb Elimelech is a critical piece in the history of Hasidut and the Hasidic movement, um, largely because he really illustrates the concept and elaborates on kind of what it means to be a tzaddik, what it means to be a rabbi in the movement. And a lot uh, becomes a big inspiration for many of the rabbis that come after him, um, who studied his work and then Works. So we're going to take a little bit of a uh, look at that today, and I will put it up on the screen. Any questions before I begin? Any residual questions from last week or questions in general? Should have asked that before I launched into my monologue on Rebeli Melech, but uh, I forgot. So it happens. Um, so there's that. So I, can you guys all see the sheets? I hope. It's always great when technology works for us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and begin as we will normally do. Welcome, uh, Parshat Kitisa. Um, if somebody wants to begin with the verse that he's going to expound, and then we'll kind of go from there. Well, when you count literally, lift up the head of the Israelites to count them from Exodus okay. 30. It seems to me. Well, well let's, let's just take one second. So, does everybody know what's going on in this section in the Torah? Uh, we actually read it a couple of weeks ago um, as our special Maftir portion, and now we're reading it today as our Torah portion. Or not today. Well, yes, today, but also on uh, Shabbat. Um, let me go ahead. No, is it what's going on? What's going on in the Torah during this with this verse? Are we enumerating all the tribes? Not yet. That's not. Uh, we're not going to do that yet. That comes later. Does it have to do with the with the contribution to the to the Mishkan, each according to his ability? Uh, this close. Yes. Um, <laughs> so what do we do? We, so what God tells Moses is you are supposed to, um, I almost, I, I don't like the word tax that has a bad connotation, but you're supposed to collect from every individual, a half shekel, um, which is going to go towards the maintenance of the Mishkan. So this half shekel tax essentially has two, um, or contribution has two goals to it. One is, as I just said, it maintains the Mishkan. So um, all the money gets collected and it goes toward, it. when there was a temple, it was going to the temple and would make sure that there was enough for each of the daily sacrifices um, and any other sacrifices that the temple had to provide. And that the this money kind of went towards that and any repairs that the temple needed might need done um, on a regular basis. We all know old buildings, even young buildings, need uh, need regular repairs and upkeep. So this kind of helped finance that. The other purpose, particularly um, in Moses' time, was as a way of counting and a census of how many people there were. So you collect a half shekel from um, everybody, 
Um, and then you count how many half shekels you have, you know how many people there are that you collected from, and it acts as a kind of census in that set, in that way. So that um, so that means a half shekel was collected on the for each person in the family. Um, the Torah itself is not entirely clear. Um, the rabbis later will kind of say each male, um, and I think each male up to a certain age. So I believe it's about, if I remember correctly, it's about 12 to 40, I think is where they collected from. Um, and there's the conversations in the Talmud about, you know, if you have a 12 year old who doesn't have their own money, can the father pay for him? And you know, does he have to give him the shekel to then give it? Whatever. But um, no, it seems to be largely, at least the rabbis interpreted it as males, but um, the Torah itself is a little more vague right. on who is supposed to be, who you're supposed to collect from. Um, the one thing it does say however, is that everybody has to pay the same amount. So whether you are wealthy or you are poor, everybody gives the same half shekel. Rabbi, this is a silly question, but they left Egypt as slaves. They've been wandering in the desert. Where do they get the money? <laughs> Excellent. Anybody know the answer or remember? Well, they took a lot of gold and jewels and things with them when they 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 made it themselves, right? Uh, so yes, I actually I get this question a lot um, around this time of year, um, but usually I get it. You know, where they get the wood for the mishkan? Where they get the skins? Where they get the gold, the silver? Like where they get all the this stuff? Um, and the I think the most direct answer is if you read the Torah carefully, there's a part just before they leave, the night before they leave, God tells them to go to the Egyptians and ask them for, basically for everything. And the Israelites kind of collect, the Egyptians kind of readily give it to them. And then the Israelites collect it and then they leave. Um, so that's where they're getting. So they do collect a lot of gold, silver, money, copper, uh, animal skins, wood, all the materials that they need kind of seems to have been um, given to them by the Egyptians. Okay. <laughs> it's a good question because uh, I get that. I, I tend to get that a lot because people are like, where did they have, they, they left the slaves. Where did they get all these materials to build the tabernacle? Um, is this supposed to last them for 40 years? Or of course, they don't know how long they're going to be gone or need this stuff but so yes on uh, one hand it kind of lasts them you know but on the other hand the cost of living in the wilderness is pretty low um you know they have their own they have their own tents so they and so they don't really have to pay rent or mortgage um food is provided for them by god water is provided from the for them by god um they seem to have left with cattle and things like that. So, um, you know, it just seems that having 40 years of, of gold and silver, you know, half shekels, etc., for 40 years, it, it'd be hard to carry around that much. But what do I know? Well, I, I've, I've read, and, and I guess this isn't exactly in the Torah, that during the 40 years in the wilderness, they were also essentially um, trading um, their uh, developing their flocks and and their livestock and so on and so forth and and trading and selling that with um, with other with other communities so that they were not really um, all alone in the wilderness and they did have a way of um, accumulating goods and, and money. Yeah, uh, Torah doesn't seem to suggest that they're really trading with other groups so much. Um, right, I'm not so much in the Torah, but... Yeah, um, 
logically that seems to make sense, but I think some of it is also what do they need to spend money on, right? Like they, they kind of, with the gold and silver and copper that they need is primarily for the construction of the Mishkan. After that, what do they really need any of it for? Well, it, I, I seem to recall that, and maybe somebody mentioned this because I, I might have uh, not been paying attention for a couple of seconds there, but wasn't the, the, the metal that was used to, to mint the, the half shekels did that come from from melting down the golden calf? Um, does not, not seem so. Okay, um, just wondering. I believe the the golden calf gets ground up and then they yeah. make people drink it. Well, um, is there some? It seems to me that there there ought to be some connection with it. I mean, symbolic if nothing else, just as an atonement, really, because. The, the shekels are, you know, capital. They can be used to, um, you know, do business or whatever needs to be done. They have value. Um, yeah, and I the think, that's, a, really does I think not. that's a drosh for another time. Okay. Only because this is also the parsha in which the golden calf occurs. Yes. Um, so the connection between those is possible. And not the direction that Noam Eli Malik is going to go. In. Oh, okay. In fact, in, he's going to go in a completely different direction because that's what <laughs> Hasidic rabbis do. But I just want to go and make sure you guys understood the basic concept of where we were and what was going on. Um, Stuart does bring up a good point, and uh, Marsha does too, of you know how exactly did they carry all of this stuff that they left Egypt with? It seems like there's a lot of stuff. Not a logistical question that they really deal with, but it come, you can ask, it's, it's a fair question. Um, now, as a fair warning, um, the Noam Eli Melech is now going to play a lot of word games in Hebrew. So there's going to be a lot of kind of Hebrew words mixed in here um, because he's, he's creating a lot of puns. Um, so if somebody wants to take off, Take the next one. Uh, you'll get the first set of puns through here. But should I continue? If you so desire. It seems to me that this relates to what is mentioned in the Gomorrah. He, the priest, lights the Western candle and then lights the other candles from it. And from it, the, he puts the oil. He puts the oil. <laughs> There are those who say that our rabbis are alluding in this passage to the tzaddik, who is called the Western candle, according to what is mentioned in the Gomorrah. Why is it called Babylon? Because there is a mixture of Mishnah, Gomorrah, and Agado narrative stories. Similarly, the tzaddik is a mixture of all types of holy service, love, awe, reverence for God, Torah, prayer, tzedakah, teshuva, acts of loving kindness, and the like. Therefore, he is called the Western candle, like mixture. Western may also refer to pleasantness and sweetness, since tzaddik is pleasant and sweet in many ways. Great. So if that didn't make sense in English, there's a lot, there, it's because there's a lot of wordplay going on here. So let's kind of walk through it. Um, so he's relating this phrase, uh, this verse um, about um, the beginning of the census to this from the Gemara, from the Talmud, from Masechet Shabbat, that the priest lights the Western candle and then lights the other candles from it. And then from it, he puts the oil. What is going on? What is the shot? What is actually, what is the Talmud actually describing here? Lighting a menorah. Good. How do you light the menorah in the temple? So the menorah is in the temple. It needs to be relit. So what does he do? He takes the westernmost candle there and he lights, um, he lights it and then uses that to light all the other candles 
and similarly takes oil from that to put in all the other containers to keep the other ones lit and then puts the wicker. So it all starts from the Western candle. In Hebrew, the, he the Hebrew word for um, Western is ma'arav. Or here, uh, ma'aravi um, as an adjective. Uh, why, by the way, is it called ma'arav? Is that where the sun sets? It sounds like ma'ari, like the evening. Good, because the sun sets in the west. Right. So when it's evening, the sun is in the west. So it kind of, there's a connection between Erev, um, evening, and Ma'ariv. Uh, um, Ma'ariv is the service. Erev is evening. Um, Arvit is another name for the service. Ma'arav, it's all kind of connected through the same term because that, you know, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Um, so Ma'arav or Ma'arvi Ma is western. Um, well, let me let me ask you, uh, is it also referring to the orientation of the menorah when you light it? I mean, like, I never heard that, but on Hanukkah, are you supposed to put the menorah so that the... The shamus is headed, you know, towards the west. Excellent or? question. No, uh, this is referring specifically to the menorah in the temple and how it would be lit. You don't. The only the way you light the menorah for Hanukkah is it's supposed to go in your in the window that faces the outside, ideally. So whichever um, wherever people are most, whichever window people are most likely to see it from. Uh, so it doesn't really matter the direction. It kind of matters more the direction of your house. It's supposed to face the public. And then you light it. Um, you add candles from right to left, and then you let light from left to right. So um, the newest candle first. But that has not, that's, that has, Hanukkah does not, is not related to this. Um, Okay, so he lights the ner ma'arvi and then lights other candles from it and then he puts the oil meti. Um, so we'll get back to the oil a little later. Um, kind of file that in your memory bank for the moment. So that's the section, that's the what the Gemara says in Masechet Shabbat. Now he's going to explain it. There are those who say that our rabbis are alluding in this section on from the Sechet Shabbat, in this passage, to the tzaddik, as the tzaddik is called the Western Candle. Why is the tzaddik called the Western Candle? Let's find out. Um, and he's going to quote another piece of Gemara, another section of Talmud, this time from the Sechet Sanhedrin. Why is... Why is it called Babel? Why is it called Babylon? Um, I should have thrown in one more uh, little thing here, but there's a mixture of Mishnah. The word uh, mixture that is used in the Talmud here is Belula, which I think they're trying to connect Belula with Babel. I'm not sure it's a great word play on, the, on their part there, but... Um, We'll run with it. Um, because there's a belula, a mixture of Mishnah, Gemara, and Agadot. Um, so let's just kind of review. What's Mishnah? It's the oral Torah. Well, this, all of these are oral Torah. Well, yeah, but I mean, but, just the, um, like the first, the first, uh, anyway, yeah, it's what's commentary on the on the Torah, Mishnah? Not quite. No? Uh, Mishnah specifically refers oh, to... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm confusing with Midrash. Excuse me. Yes, I know. Right. So what's Mishnah? You got it? Or are you still... <laughs> so, mi all good. Mishnah um, is a collection of early teachings collected by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi and his students and then um, edited together around 220 CE. Um, 
so thinking of it this way for a long time teachings um this this period that the mishnah was written is called tanaim the tanayinic period the tanaim what does tana mean tana means to repeat uh, it comes from the same root as like sheni uh like second to go back and forth so how did they used to do it the teacher would sit down on a bench his students would sit on the floor in front of him and the and the tana would teach and they would memorize what he said and then repeat it back to him. That's how they organize this. And that's why you get a lot about, you know, Rabbi so-and-so said this, because that was their job was to memorize this. So it was Yehuda Hanisi, was he the one that people got, a lot of people got really angry at because he wanted to actually write things down? instead of repeat them orally? I'm sure it was controversial. Um, but at least in the Talmud, he seems to be pretty universally loved and praised. Um, but yes, he took, he kind of organized a lot of these oral teachings and put them into groups. So the large group is called a Seder. Um, there's uh, six Seders. And then within those, there's what's called a masechet or masechtot, plural, um, that's on more specific topics. So, for example, um, because we're, I'm in the process of daf yomi, and this is where my mind is going, um, we're currently in Seder Nashim, which deals with a lot of uh, women's issues. And within that, we're in masechet uh, Nazir which deals specifically with all the laws around taking a Nazarite vow. Um, so that, and then the, from there it's broken into chapters and then individual Mishnayot. Um, so Mishnah is the larger collection that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi put together around 220 CE um, of all the early literature. Gemara refers to so after you, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi put together the Mishnah, what do we, as Jews, what do we do? We start trying to understand the Mishnah and we start studying the Mishnah as a way to understand what's going on. And those, and that period becomes known um, as the Amoraic period. Um, and they go back and forth and there's a, again it starts getting passed down orally um and the arguments are passed down orally until they are put together in what is called the gemara which essentially acts ostensibly as a commentary to the mishnah you put the gemara and the mishnah together and you have the talmud So you have um, Mishnah, Gemara, and Agadot. Agadot are narrative stories that usually help illustrate um, illustrate or teach something relevant. So um, so there's uh, uh, there's some good. Agadot um, that we read a while back about, you know, what are the obligations of a husband to his wife? And it goes that, well, you know, Rabbi Akiva, um, you know, wanted to marry this woman. And she said, only on the condition you learn Torah. And so he goes and leaves to be to learn and then comes back and she says, you need to go learn more. And so he leaves again and then comes back and his her father says, you know, I don't want you marry. I like. Her father was against the marriage in the first place and then finds out he comes back with all these with like thousands of students and then he's like oh you should marry this guy and she's like i already did um that's an agada it becomes to kind of illustrate um it comes to illustrate a point or a piece of halakha or something like that or to, to reinforce something that has been taught Everybody good so far?
Great. So the rabbi, so going back to the candle, there are those who say that the rabbis are alluding to the tzaddik, who is the Western candle, because, because there is in Babylonia, which is where the Babylonian Talmud was written, there was a mixture of Mishnah, Gemara, and Agadot. Similarly, the Noam Ali Melech says, the tzaddik himself is a mixture, a me'urav, which also comes from the same Hebrew root as um, as ma'ariv or ma'arav or uh, ma'arvi. Um, it's the same root, is a different meaning of the same root, but it, me, it's a mixture of types of holy service. He's The tzaddik serves out of love, out of awe, out of reverence for God, out of Torah, out of prayer, out of tzedakah, out of tshuva, Gimilud chasadim, acts of loving kindness, all these things. So he is called Ma'arvi because he is Me'urav. He is a mixture of all kinds of service within him. Um, that's why he's called the Western Candle, Ner Ma'arvi, like Me'urav. Um, and then he gives another interpretation here where Western may refer to pleasantness, which is Arevut. So ma'arvi, arevut, again, the same Hebrew root. Um, he's pleasant and sweet because that's the way the tzaddik is supposed to act towards everybody. So what are the three letters of the of the root? It's ayin, resh, bet. Ayin, resh, and? Bet. Rabbi, can I interrupt for a minute? I'm just You're not interrupting, to... but if you want to wait a minute, then you then I'll start talking, then you can interrupt. Otherwise, okay. you can just jump. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, like in the Talmud, the Mishnah is like the first statement. And then, is that correct? And then you go to the Gemara, and it actually is all the arguments that go back and forth and break it down. Is that correct? More or less, yes. Okay. Um, you will well, occasionally, the Gemara will cite Mishnah as a way of like comparing or advancing or discussing it. But yes, that's the general, that's so, the general idea is that the Mishnah, the, it'll say, and it says in the, if you read a Talmud, it says like Mishnah, and right. then we'll give the Mishnah and then it'll say Gemara and then it'll go into pages and pages of discussion on that Mishnah. Sometimes relevant, sometimes it'll get sidetracked. Yeah, and but, sometimes yeah. it'll it'll go crazy back and forth but um can where is the agadot i mean you talk about the agadot where do you find that is that in the is does that follow it's, yeah it's it's a so the gemara typically has two kinds of generally considered two kinds of text within it one is halakha which are the back and forth legal arguments so um you know, whether a Nazir can, uh, a, whether a bald Nazir has to shave his head, which I was just reading about this morning, is that a Nazir, when he finishes his term as a Nazir, has to shave his head and then burn his hair uh, in the, but if you're bald, do you still have to shave your head? So that's a halachic argument back and forth. Okay. Um, an agada. Here's, here's one of my favorite examples of Agadah, is in Brachot, there's a whole section about whether the dead know what's going on in this world. And it brings in a series of Agadot as proof back and forth about whether the dead know what's going on in this world. So, um, so what, there's one great one about, you know, this guy, gets into a fight with his wife and so he goes to sit in the cemetery and while he's there he sees two spirits um one of them's like hey let's go behind the curtain and see what's going to go on this year and one of them the other one says i can't because of the way i'm buried so you go and tell me what's going on so the other one goes and comes back a little while later and says ah i found out this like i found out like the rain it's going to be super rainy this time of year and so the guy hears this and goes back and uses that to his advantage, a little insider trading, makes a lot of money. So he figures the next year he's going to go back. So he goes back again 
And same conversation happens. One of the spirits says, I can't because of the, you go tell me what happens. And so the other spirit goes, finds out what's going to happen, says, oh, this bad, this is going, this, some, this bad thing is going to happen at this time of year. So he goes, so the guy hears and goes and uses it to his advantage. And again, like doesn't do things this time of year so that he do, it doesn't get destroyed and he makes a lot of money. And then he goes back the third year and one of the, the spirits says, hey, let's go find out what's going to happen. And the other one says, somebody's been listening. We shouldn't be talking anymore. <laughs> we should be quiet because somebody's been listening to our conversation. Mm -hmm. And this is, comes to prove that the dead know what's going on in this world because clearly they were able to see what this guy was doing. That's an agada. It takes like a part of an argument and tries and turn uses a story or a narrative as a way of proving or disproving a particular point in the in the argument. Okay, thank you. I will good. say there's a lot of scholarly debate about how agada is used in the Talmud. Um, that's the way I was kind of taught it, but I, not every agada comes to serve that purpose. But that's let's just kind of run with it. For today, for now. So, Rabbi, how would how would we translate the word Haggadah into English, or or what are some of the translations? Haggadah, <laughs> yeah. Is story. it narrative? Story, narrative. Story. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. Is Thank is you. it too like like Haggadah? It it is it is semantically related to Haggadah. Yes, which is like a telling. So an agada is like a telling. Um, you get this in midrash too. There's you know halachic midrash, where you it tries to look at the Torah and then understand the halacha and argue the halacha out from the Torah. And there's agadic midrash in which it'll tell like a nice story that ends up proving, teaching some kind of value based on the story. So. Um, you know, there's a great Agata, Agatic Midrash and how Rachel and Leah betray Jacob and how uh, it ends up that Rachel is laying under the bed while Jacob and Leah are having sex on their wedding night and she's the one talking while Leah is staying quiet so Jacob doesn't realize it and Jacob wakes up in the morning and goes, hey, this is Leah, you tricked me, how could you trick me? And she looks back and goes, I'm sorry, you, I followed my father's instructions. You're the one who betrayed your father. Who are you to talk about lying and tricking somebody? Um, which teaches a whole thing about midah kenegin midah and whether or not uh, that every action gets repaid by the same measure. Um, that's an aga, that's agada. That's a story that doesn't have a halachic point, but kind of teaches a more of a value statement. Everybody good? So to come back to this, uh, come back to the Noam Elimelech. So the, the Tzadik, the Rebbe, is viewed as the Ner Ma'arvi because he is a mixture of all sorts of holy service. Um, he is uh, playing off Aravi, Ma, uh, excuse me, Ma'arvi and Me'urav. Who wants to go next? Who wants to read next for us? Uh, I'll try. This is the interpretation of he lights other candles from it. The other candles are people who are connected to the tzaddik. They light their candles, their souls, through love and awe for the blessing creator. The interpretation of form, I'm sorry, of from it, he puts the oil, uh, Metiv, through the tzaddik, the blessing one, makes good things happen in the world. Yeah. Metiv. So what's, what's, what's the Noam Elimelech arguing here? What's the job of the tzaddik? To inspire other people? Good. To inspire other people to get close to God 
to inspire other people in their service to God. Um, and how does how does the tzaddik do that? By lighting your candle. Good. So, at least the way I'm reading this here is that the tzaddik is a mixture of all these different qualities that he mentioned above, right? Um, love, awe, reverence for God, Torah, prayer, tzedakah, tshuva, gemilut chasadim, all these different kinds. The, the tzaddik does all of these things, it represents all of these things. But I think part of the implication here is that not everybody is supposed not ever whoever's not a tzaddik isn't going to be all of these things either, just like the tzaddik is. Rather, I think each of us has our own priority, our own root, our own essence here that we are connected to. And part of the tzaddik's job is to help you uncover that essence that you connect with, that area of service that you can then connect with God through that area of service. So whether some people are love, need the love and that's the way they connect is through love. Other people connect through tshuva and reflecting on their deeds and trying to make it better. Other people connect through prayer. The tzaddik's job is to help you find that path to be able to connect you to God through that. It also seems like, tell me if I'm right or wrong, that you're describing this, the uh, stereotypic Chabad Rebbe, you know, that that's the type of um, projection that, uh, that a, uh, somebody in Chabad wants to make, you know, there's a pleasantness, it's a feeling while they're teaching, you know, uh, you're, you're getting closer to God, but, but they do it with that sort of sense. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I think it is. And I think, as I said, um, the Noam Eli Melech was a pretty early Rebbe and inspired generations of Rebbe's after him. And I think, yes, I think uh, whether or not Chabad rabbis are conscious of it, whether or not they've studied the Noam Eli Melech, I think they are studying people who have studied the Noam Eli Melech. Um, and so, yes, I think they're pulling some of that with them as well. If this is the way you're supposed to be able to connect. Um, and this is the way you bring people together is through pleasantness, through the love, through um, through this, we inspire through that relationship and the love and the caring that we show you will inspire you to do mitzvot, which will inspire you to do more mitzvot. Um, yeah, slightly I, different than the way I'm teaching it, but like that's that's I think the Chabad way. I think the way I'm trying to I'm understanding it is kind of part of the Rebbe's job is to help you understand the path through which you best connect to Judaism and the way you best connect with God and help you on that path to be able to do that. Rabbi, yeah. Um, don't you think that it's just not isolated? I guess we were talking about Hasidus and, and, and Rebbe's. But in general, there are many rabbis of communities who actually take on that role and are very good at it. So I would consider that person exotic in that respect. Um, yes. And that, that was kind of the direction I was going to go at some point. I hadn't decided if I was going to do it here or later. I can see how the conversation flowed. But I don't think it's exclusive to Rebbe's, no. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually, I think this is the job of any leader of any kind of organization is to inspire the people to be able to move forward in their mission. Um, and part of the way you do that is through helping them connect with a particular way that they are able to best advance the mission in a way that's meaningful for them. So, you know, if you're in a corporation and somebody really loves marketing, you don't put them in the HR department, <laughs> right? 
If you're Don't the CEO, you. <laughs> you need to inspire them by inspiring them for the path right. that they actually can get excited about and do it. Um, right. But that's, you know, and similarly, as a, as a rabbi, my job's, you know, as much as I want to inspire people to prayer and to tefillah, that might not be everybody's best path to it. It might be, it should be part of the path, but it might not be the only path. And then I have, so we have to find the path that best connects you to God and to serving God. Not at the exclusion of the others, but what is the path that is that you most strongly connect with? So no, it doesn't, it's not Hasidic necessarily, but I think it's good leadership advice in general. Thank you. Um, and I would, uh, and I think part of his argument then too is the second drosh that he puts here that from it, from the tzaddik he puts the oil, uh, the metiv, is that through through the tzaddik, through the tzaddik's ability to help people connect with God, to have law and love, law, <laughs> love and awe. That's what law was supposed to be. I feel like there's a midrash on that too, that law is love and awe, but uh, that's going to be a different sermon for, I have to develop that outside of the two seconds I just accidentally misspoke. Um through the love and awe that the tzaddik inspires in other people to connect with God, by them better connecting with God, it brings good things into the world, metiv. Um, we call God hamitiv, the God, one who makes good things happen. So through this connection where God bring, this makes, makes, brings more good into the world. Everybody follow? Questions, comments, thoughts? And you might be wondering, what does this have to do with the verse that we still haven't talked about? I'm so glad you asked. That's a wonderful question. Let's go ahead and uh, finish it up. Uh, who wants to take us home? I'll read that. All right. And this is what the Holy Blessing One said to Moses. When you count the head of the Israelites, it means when you lift up their hearts toward what is above, to the head, which is the upper worlds, which is called head, so that love, awe, and holiness enters their hearts. To count them means to do so in order that they will have a good accounting of blessings, since the Zadik decrees and declares and the Holy Blessing One fulfills it. Good. So kind of tying all these pieces back up. So why does, so in Hebrew, the phrase is ki tisa, which is where we get the name of the parsha. Um, it's usually translated as count, because that's really the intent of the verse. But literally, it says ki tisa et rosh b'nei Yisrael, when, when you lift up the head of the Israelites. Um, so what he's reading that is different is that you're not lifting up the head, you're lifting every you're lifting the Israelites' hearts towards the head, which is God, the upper worlds. So that their hearts are full of love and awe and holiness, and they're directed towards the head, towards God. Um, when you do that. They will have a good accounting. A picky, uh, the Hebrews, uh, oh, let me just find it. Leaf uh, kudehem um, seems to be like to take account of. Uh, Picard tends to, has a connotation of like to take account of. Um, so even if um, when you when you're here for services and we end the first when we say the bless, first blessing we say Magen Avraham Ufoked Sarah. Uh, the shield of Abraham and the one who took account of Sarah. Um, same root, Poked Sarah. Um, so that when they when the Israelites turn their hearts to God, then you will give them a good accounting, a pikida um, of blessings. And then he has another little one here, which 
he's big on and other Hasidic rabbis are big on too, is that the tzaddik dec decrees and dec makes a declaration, poked, and the Holy Blessing One fulfills it. That there's, and I think we've seen this before, but it comes up frequently where um, there's this idea that the tzaddik has the ability to overrule God. Um, and that when the tzaddik says something, God is going to follow it based on their holiness. And there's a little bit a little bit here at the end that the tzaddik decrees and declares and the Holy Blessing One will fulfill it. But I think the idea generally is that as the tzaddik is able to you to inspire others in their particular path to get closer to God, that will then be returned onto them as, with the blessings that they receive in their life. So, Rabbi, I don't know if, um, it, at least it brings to mind to me this whole argument about who is a Jew. And, of course, that's an argument that is still ongoing in the state of Israel today, right? And the right of return and all that stuff. But uh, if the tzaddik can intervene, if the tzaddik, in essence, can decide whether you're holy enough to be counted as a Jew, I mean, is that is that where the rabbis in Israel come back to this type of teaching to help decide who they can include or exclude as being Jewish? I don't think they would turn to this teaching to prove that. I think they would turn to other ones um, as ways of limiting who is who is Jewish as a way of solidifying their own power. But that's a whole different conversation. Um, I, I'm not sure. I see where you're going. I'm not sure that's exactly where the Noam Eli Melech is going with this. I think what he's trying to say is the tzaddik should be should it should uh what's the word should exemplify arevut should it, uh, pleasantness and sweetness and should be a kind loving gentle person. And based on that, based on his behavior, because of that, he is able to inspire others, but also that he has an influence on God through his ability and his pleasantness. I don't think that he's trying to, uh, I don't want to say he wouldn't, but, you know, I don't think that's the argument he's saying is that this, that the, he has the ability to declare who is and who is not Jewish. Um, though to some extent he does because he'd be the kind of the head of the community. So he gets to kind of decide who's in and who's out of the community. But um, I don't think that's really the direction he's going. I think he's saying that the tzaddik is supposed to inspire others to better relationship and connection with God. And that's really the tzaddik's job. I'd like to take it a step further in connecting what we just read to the to the beginning. So it's um, another way that the that Saudi can um, inspire and, and serve God. It goes back to the, the lifting up at the beginning that in noticing each individual, um, it's it's a Saudi saying each and every one of you is special. And each and every, and I, and I recognize each and every one of you, and you each have the opportunity to serve God through your, your, your donation. So it's, in, I see it more than just because he is, he is good and kind and smart that he's a tzaddik, but in the acknowledgement of e of the uniqueness in each individual he is lifting them up and giving them the opportunity to be closer to God, that they, that they feel that they are not deserving, but that, that they are, that they are special. Beautiful. Absolutely. Could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, um, I understand the, what the role of the tzaddik is and, and Cindy really explained it 
there, you know, in a in a lovely way. Um, the part that I'm not so clear on is how it is is how the tzaddik affects God. Um, yeah. Um... We may have to dig into that a little deeper and find like a different text that might explain it better. <clears throat> I think the general principle is that the tzaddik, the rabbi, has a special spiritual connection that is above and beyond the average person. As such, the Rebbe has a special relationship with God that is above and beyond the average person. And in that sense, you know, when you have a special relationship, you get special privileges that not everybody else gets. Um, so I think that that's kind of the way I think I think about it is that, you know, God's going to listen to the Rebbe in a way that God wouldn't listen to other people. You know, years ago, I read um, Heschel's God in Search of Man. Um, and it's so long ago that I couldn't really explain anything about it. But I wonder if I, I wonder if this is connected to that in some way. So for those, who, what's Heschel's background? He's a, 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 comes from a long line of uh, Hasidim. Yes, he's a, he, he was in line to be the Rebbe at some point before the war and then was sent away and the rest of his dynasty kind of died out in the war. He was part of the apt Hasidic dynasty and there's, actually a number of Abraham Joshua Heschel's in the apt Hasidic dynasty. Um, so yes, I, I, I think there is, he, he is heavily influenced by Hasidut because that's where he came from and that was his upbringing. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the direction he goes in. Um, Heschel was a little more looking at as much as he respects the Hasidic thought and as much as it influences him, he doesn't seem to be very keen on, you know, in certain individuals getting higher spiritual priority than others. He seems to be, at least the way I read Heschel, he seems to be much more trying to shed light on the spiritual problems of our age and what he sees as the resolution of those problems, um, many of which tie into a disconnection from, from God, a disconnection of wonder, a disconnection from spirituality that he sees, and which is, by the way, all very tied into Hasidut, that, you know, we can't get so caught up in the halakha that we forget about the, we forget about God. Um, I think he's much more tied into that than he is into this doctrine of the Rebbe. But I, I'm sure it influences him to some extent. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, thinking so much about the, the Rebbe as in the fact that that um that God needs man maybe as much as man needs God. That's yes. that's 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 the direction. That is a long Kabbalistic and Hasidic um trope and one of the reasons why i love kabbalah and Hasidu because i i think that's an important point that we often lose in judaism otherwise i think it's a great contribution of the mystical movement that god needs us as much as we need god that often gets lost otherwise other comments questions thoughts Kola Kavod, everybody. Thank you for learning together. Um, good to see y'all and good to learn with y'all. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, 
as, as always, uh, if I don't see you before then, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, I hope to see you on Shabbat. And if I don't see you on Shabbat, then I hope to see you soon. And if I don't, then I hope to see you next Thursday. And we'll do this again then. <laughs> so uh, take care, everybody. Be well. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.